Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert, and I am thrilled that you're joining us for another captivating episode. Today's is titled, No Condemnation, Pure Liberation. Now, if that title doesn't shout freedom, I don't know what does. But in today's episode, we're going to dive into the beautiful words of Romans 8, get ready to shed the chains of guilt and step into a new life filled with the Spirit's empowerment. We're also going to unravel the parable of the 10 virgins from Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Are your lamps filled with oil? We're talking readiness and anticipation here, folks. Then we're going to switch gears. We're going to explore Psalm 59. David pours out his soul here, showing us how to seek divine protection when surrounded by danger. And last but not least, we're venturing into the often overlooked book of Numbers, specifically chapters 28, 29, and 30. Expect the unexpected as we dissect rituals, vows, and how they relate to our modern spiritual lives. So buckle up as we get ready to go on this journey through the message. Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert. And my name is Heidi. Hey, Heidi, how are you? I'm doing amazingly (laughs) well. So, so good. I know. It's been a great day. Man, Mm -hmm. right now, today is the end of, it's the beginning of October. I was going to say the end of September. October Um, already. So we are the very first day of October and we had like an 80 degree day today. It was spectacular insane just absolutely beautiful we were sitting outside for a while this evening together just enjoying this sun Uh, who knows you know how much more here in michigan i know it could turn at any time i know our weather gets like that this time of year but i'm gonna whoop change the subject real quick oh we're changing subjects we are i think that we need to talk about an event that happened this weekend and i would love to hear your perspective oh on this yeah and i'm gonna throw a little twist at you sure i want you to talk about it in a way that makes them understand what your expectations were initially or let's say your wants sure, for it sure and what it turned into So for those of you that don't know, we had an event this weekend with Crossroads Prison Ministries, and it was the Crossroads Run. I was the race director. I mean, this is crazy, guys. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) I got out of prison eight years ago, (laughs) and Mm -hmm. here I am now working for this prison ministry. And in fact, there was a prison guard there. His name is Carl Smith, and he came up to me and said, man, this is such a cool event because how many other places can I go to run where it's going to be put on by somebody that was in prison, but now they're out of prison and doing something great. And it's for this prison ministry. He goes, the odds of this ever happening. I mean, it's just not going to (laughs) happen. So, you know, initially with the event, you know, we have never done anything like this with Crossroads. Oh, brand new adventure for you guys. And, you know, I've ran in hundreds of races, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell you right now, (laughs) running in hundreds of races and race directing a race Mm. are two completely different things. Mm. Absolutely. Piece of cake. Was it really easy? I'm telling you, (laughs) this was a learning experience and I hats off to all the race directors, really. Oh, for sure. I mean, they make it look easy. All of the races that I've ever done that maybe... If I've forgotten to say thank you, oh, I am sure. sorry because um, I just want to go on record saying thank <laughs> you to all the race directors out there. So, um, but no, so, you know, we had no idea really what to expect. And it was a lot of, you know, let's, let's try this, let's try that. You know, we're just seeing what would work. Yeah. And initially going into it, you know, we have no idea, you know, are we going to get a couple hundred people to sign up? Are we going to get like three, four hundred? You you don't know. And Mm -hmm. we have a really strong network of churches and mentors and everything in West Michigan, but it's not necessarily 
this event isn't necessarily something that they're accustomed to. So it's new. Really, for everybody. yeah, it's new for everybody. And so initially, I want to say like I was putting a lot of emphasis on mm. like we need to be at a certain number to be quote unquote successful. Oh, yeah. Right. We got to hit X amount of registrations. You know, I've you know I want to have you know this big event. I want everybody's effort is mm-hmm. kind of how I was feeling. I wanted everybody's effort to be worth it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. when the event started getting closer, we had, I, I want to say 35, 40 registrations. Mm-hmm. And there was a time where I was definitely feeling maybe a little down, like, oh man, I feel like something I did wasn't right. Or uh, maybe my marketing of this way or that way wasn't right. Or, you know, you just, you don't know. And then something crazy happened. Like I had the opportunity early on with promoting the race to put like two or three sentences about the race and also inviting the people that were going to see this because this was a publication going to our students. So it's called Just for Students and it goes into jails and prisons nationwide. And it's really just encouraging things for them. It highlights some students. It shows some artwork. It's really a beautiful publication. And so I got like two or three sentences at the bottom. I mean, no pictures, mm-hmm. no, no nothing fancy. Just a little blurb. Just a little blurb at the bottom saying, hey, write me a letter if you're interested in joining us on September 30th. And then something crazy happened. What I, happened, Robert? I started getting letters from people, men and women, mm-hmm. in jails and prisons from across the country. I think total we got around 25. There's probably more sitting in my... <laughs> I know they'll probably continue to come in. Yeah. These letters were so heartwarming. I mean, uh, there were literally days where I was at my desk reading some of these letters and and crying, Mm -hmm. knowing that the people that needed to be impacted by this race were. Yes. And no matter what my registration numbers were, the event was a out of the park success. Yes, it was. Because of those letters. I mean... These letters were, every single one of them, encouraging and loving and how can we pray for you? And we're committing to 30 minutes of prayer. We're committing to an hour of exercise. We've measured out the distance in our cell and we are going to work out, you know, we, we know how many feet is in this circle and then we know how many times we have to do that circle in order to get a mile and we know how long that's going to take so we're committing to doing that we're committing to doing push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and like iron man style workouts anything I mean, they can do in the place they are fasting i mean these mm. are you kidding me <laughs> people, there there is two guys that wrote to me that were both crossroads students They're in a six foot by nine foot cell because the yard that they're on is so violent. They said the only way to stay safe is to lock up in this. And they're in there 24 hours a day. And they said their letters were so joyful. I mean, the one guy was talking about, hey, you know, here's your letter from the funny farm down here in Georgia. And I mean, Mm. every single word in that letter was joyful, encouraging, loving, And it was an honor to share some of those stories. So once the event got closer, I thought, you know what? It it would be great to take some excerpts out of that, which I did. I put them together in a nice little uh, flip book type thing. It's easy to read. I'll put a link down in the comments. So uh, if you want to look at it, take a look at it. It's really beautiful, just heartfelt encouragement from some people that really have every reason in the world it's to gonna be angry or bitter or whatever or but they're saying we want to pray for you we want to yeah. be involved we want to get you know we want to be a part of this so it you just sharing that helps put a human face on it mm. it's it's easy to not do that yeah. it's easy to overlook forget and truly they are the epitome out of out of sight out of mind and I started thinking about it, and I think that's one of the only segments of our society that truly is in that out of sight, out of mind category. Even um, the homeless, they're in sight. We see them. Sure. 
but literally, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands locked away, a lot of them for the rest of their days here. Yeah. How do they find hope? And to me, I'm like, they need Jesus. It's the only way to be free in that position that they're in. But if nobody is willing to do, you know, to do the work, to show them they care, to show systems that this changes the whole atmosphere it makes them safer and better and yeah i just wish that they would open up more to what would truly help make changes behind bars for them i am so glad that the person god put me in my life challenged every thought that i had about incarcerated mm. people and i never gave them the dignity that they deserve as fellow humans mm-hmm. And they were the less than, they were the segment that it was okay to openly say they're less than while they're locked up. Yeah. And I now see every single one of them as created in the very image of God with the same, but I love them. Yeah. And I, I want them to know me. And the only way they will know him is if you tell them how many have tried to tell them. And this is one way that they can in the writing letters. And in this event, I think was so unique though, in a way that it wasn't just writing letters. It was people making a deliberate choice to drive and meet together and train and run for an event for them. Yeah, And it gives them, I think, a little sense of being human, of being part of and everybody, I feel, deserves that. Yeah. It was, a, it was a great event. We had around 70 people that were registered. And I think, uh, yeah, we had like six people mm-hmm. that were virtual uh, across the country. Mm-hmm. So we had people Yay, all you. the way from uh, New York all the way to Oregon. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really good. And we had students in, uh, well, I don't even know how many different states, but we had uh, everywhere from Hawaii Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So Hawaii all the way to New York. We had a guy who was a former Olympic uh, yeah, marathon what sprint an incredible qualifier. story that I mean, was. And he's just so open and transparent. Yeah, and Yeah. So it was the stories that have come out of it are just beginning, I believe. I believe that because I initiated uh, communication with all of them, I wrote them all back and I'm going to be sending into them because they can't get the t-shirt and they can't get the medal, unfortunately, but I am able to send in a certificate of participation. And I wrote a really nice, just heartfelt letter thanking them for choosing to get involved and Mm -hmm. how they, uh, how they said that they were. So it was, it was very good. It was very good for my heart and uh, to know there's interest for this again next year. And next year is mm-hmm. Crossroads 40th anniversary. It would be amazing to to see how this can grow. Uh, we've yes. already started knocking around some ideas, talking <laughs> about how could we get this organized inside of a of you know an institution. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what does that look Mm. like? And, you know, we have time to kind of plan some of that now. Right. And uh, But like in institutions, that's something that, man, you need to get going on groundwork like right right right. away because there's unfortunately so much red tape. Yeah. So uh, all in all, it was uh, a huge success. And we also, man, we got some amazing photos. Amazing photos. We just saw the first batch. We had three professional photographers there that we had hired and then we had our staff photographer who's just every bit as good yes <laughs> you know? he's just on staff with us but he was there and then we had uh, a couple other people show up with their yes. cameras and just took some amazing shots I'll, I'll tell you some of the most moving shots we're seeing there's this as you come up the only hill in this run There is a 15 to 20 foot tall wooden statue of Jesus with his arms open wide Mm -hmm. right at the top of that hill. Yeah, top of the rise right there. And there are some beautiful photos of people in the foreground and then that uh, statue of Jesus in the background and with his arms open. It just looks like he's blessing your run. Mm. He's watching over your path. 
I mean, they're just gorgeous I get, photos. I so got teared up. I, me too. They were visually, not just because you're the race director, yeah. but truly they were visually the most beautiful photos I have mm. ever seen so far. Haven't seen the rest <laughs> of them yet. Yeah. Um, they're just truly special, it was great. truly special race photos. And I am absolutely thrilled that everybody that participated will have an opportunity to get yeah. a incredible photo. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm going to move into the prayer real quick. And, uh, but I appreciate the support from, mm. I've gotten some really great messages from people Mike Vanderplug, thank oh, you for coming out to volunteer. Thanks for that being was a amazing. good friend. Yeah, I mean, showing up right on time, just where do you need me? Uh, he contacted me. I mean, yeah. thank you, my friend. That uh, It means a lot to me, and this event was a huge success. We had uh, some really great uh, sponsors. I don't yes. have the the list or whatever today, but mm -hmm. uh, we had some really great sponsors in the area. And what I love is that that started the conversation with some people that hadn't been really active with our ministry for maybe a year or two right. or something. So uh, now we're kind of back in the, mm -hmm. in the conversation and we appreciate the support from all of the sponsors that were involved. So uh, next year's our big 40th anniversary. Yes. So if you or someone you know <laughs> <laughs> maybe owns a company that would like to be a title sponsor for the Crossroads Run, I'm yeah, just, just saying. tuck that in your mind for just, your uh, first of your, seed, you know? your plans for, you know, maybe some it. corporate donations or that's something. It. It's truly, truly a worthy, worthy cause in your money, I can promise you, is used to reach people yeah. and it makes a difference. Yeah. So father God, thanks so much for a great last couple days. I mean, just sunny, beautiful. I mean, the photos that we just saw of mm -hmm. these runners out in your creation, the beauty of your creation, you took the time to place every blade of grass, to place every tree, to place the fog that morning, the sunlight just right. You knew, and you did it. You did it for us. You did it because you love creating and you love beauty, mm -hmm. and we love you for that. So thank you for all of the beautiful gifts that you have given us. Please be with our listeners today. Open their minds and hearts to what your word has to say, and hopefully something that maybe Heidi and I have to say just uh, encourages them along yes. and uh and through this journey that we're all on. So Father, uh, just bless us as we read today and uh, we look forward to how you're going to enlighten us. So thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So you are starting out in Matthew. I am. I'm starting out in Matthew 25. We're going to read 1 through 13. God's kingdom is like ten young virgins who took oil lamps and went out to greet the bridegroom. Five were silly and five were smart. The silly virgins took lamps, but no extra oil. The smart virgins took jars of oil to feed their lamps. The bridegroom didn't show up when they expected him, and they all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, someone yelled out, He's here! The bridegroom's here! Go out and greet him! The ten virgins got up and got their lamps ready. The silly virgin said to the smart ones, Our lamps are going out. Lend us some of your oil. They answered, There might not be enough to go around, so go buy your own. They did, but while they were out buying oil, the bridegroom arrived. When everyone who was there to greet him had gone into the wedding feast, the door was locked. Much later, the other virgins, the silly ones, showed up and knocked on the door saying, Master, we're here, let us in. And he answered, Do I know you? I don't think I know who you are. So stay alert. You have no idea when he might arrive. There's some powerful stuff in this beginning of Matthew 25. I think I was getting so excited about moving ahead in that. And then as I'm reading, I'm like, why am I so excited about moving ahead? Because this is really good advice about being ready all the time. All the time. Always. You don't need to be 
you don't have to sit there with your nose in a book all the time. You don't have to sit there trying to dig deep, learn the Greek and the Hebrew root words and all of those kind of things. But if you're not actively working on that personal faith life with God, you're going to be like the silly ones. You're going to get caught unprepared because when he shows up and you realize you've been doing it wrong, you don't have time anymore to do it the right way. Man, that just, it just increasingly gets to be a heavier and heavier thought about so many people who aren't ready but maybe think they are. It's like I feel an urgency to tell them. And sometimes that's heavy, but I think that we're supposed to feel that way when we read this. We're supposed to make sure the people we care about and love are ready. And we're the silly ones too if we aren't telling them. But I'm going to tell them now, I'm sorry, it's too late, I'm here. But I need to tell them, and it's too late then. So I, I'm i feeling like I don't want to be a silly one. So. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no silliness. <laughs> <laughs> it was heavier than I expected. A lot of people aren't prepared. They think they are. I hope that in some small way... This is part of some preparation for somebody. I mean, <laughs> can you can you imagine any ten years ago? Would anybody have picked you and I out as people that would help with preparation? No. Or so let us oh. just uh, preface that by saying uh, when you say yes to God, oh. just be ready. <laughs> be ready. Buckle and, up. Uh, yeah, be careful what you pray for. Oh, you know what? But do it anyways. But be bold. Do it. That's right. Do it. Don't be afraid to pray prayers that may seem a little crazy. All right, we're going to be doing Romans 8, and I'm reading out of verses 1 through 17. Pretty highly quoted chapter of the Bible. So if you've heard it numerous times, I would invite you to hear it from the message version. We do it out of the message version. It's a paraphrase of the Bible, but it just has a way of kind of unpacking and uncovering some things that maybe just sound a little different in the other version. So here we go. This is titled, uh, The Solution is Life on God's Terms. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a failed lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with a problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition. He entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but we couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious and free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing. And God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, 
won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you as he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ. So don't you see that we don't owe this old do-it-yourself life one red cent? There's nothing in it for us, nothing at all. The best thing to do is to give it a decent burial and get on with your new life. God's spirit beckons. There are things to do and places to go. This resurrection life that you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's an adventurous, expectant, greeting God with childlike, what's next, Papa? God's spirit touches our spirits and confirms who we really are. We know who he is, and we know who we are, father and children. And we know we are going to get what's coming to us, an unbelievable inheritance. We go through exactly what Christ goes through. If we go through the hard times with him, then we're certainly going to go through the good times with him. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all of the creatures are ready and can be released at the same time into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. All right, so that is the end of our reading in Romans, but I do have a pause here from Eugene Peterson. I can't wait. All right, so the pause here from Eugene Peterson. This is about verses 1 through 14. (laughs) He starts off here and says, Suppose I decide to build a house. To begin with, I'm quite ignorant of what must be done, and so first of all, I take a course in carpentry to learn the fundamentals of house building. I follow that one up with some specialized reading. I get a set of blueprints and I buy all the necessary tools. And then I'm ready to build my house. I struggle by myself day after day. As the house grows, I find that there are some things I had either forgotten or never knew. I seem to be all thumbs. The saw doesn't cut straight, the wood splinters. I'm lucky enough to have some neighbors who invariably have some suggestions. Hey, uh... That wall seems to be a little out of plumb there. Are you sure that's the way to set a windowsill? The more suggestions they make, the more nervous I get. Every time my neighbors show up, I feel like giving up. They are a constant reminder of my failure. One day I explode. I can do without your advice. But there's a variant in this story. Someone comes by and sees that I'm in trouble with my construction. Without criticizing or giving condescending instruction, he takes off his coat, he rolls up his sleeves, and he goes to work right beside me, sharing his skill and his energy with me. In short order, the building begins to improve, and I feel as if I'm doing something again. The presence of a skilled helper doesn't mean that I don't make any more mistakes, nor does it mean that I no longer feel any tension between what the house ought to be and my particular work on it. What it does mean is that I'm transformed in my attitude. And that is what Paul's experience was with the coming of Jesus Christ into his life. Paul, in essence, asks, who will do something besides increase my sense of failure and condemn me for being such a poor workman? The answer? Jesus. He's living in us. He's working with us. And that should encourage all of us. Mm -hmm. 
And that, friends, is a beautiful pause from Eugene Peterson. One of the things that I love doing is just giving people encouragement. Just you little do. texts of encouragement. You do. I love it. I absolutely love catching someone off guard. I love noticing the little things that they think maybe no one else sees. You're very good at that. I try. And I was humbled over the weekend with the Crossroads Run by mm-hmm. a bunch of people that did that for me. Aww. Somebody asked me, how many people, how many out of all these people here, how many do you know? And I looked around and I said, probably about 80% or yes. better. <laughs> yes. And, um, so that just meant a lot to me that people chose to spend a little sliver of their day and mm-hmm. support our ministry and get the word out. And um, it was just a pleasure to honor them with some beautiful photos and uh, just yeah. a good race experience. So um, I. That yeah. it was. It was just a spectacular morning. But Special. back to that uh, in Romans there, mm. it's powerful because if you if you look at that, think about somebody that's coming out of jail or prison. Think about somebody that's in addiction. Think about yeah. somebody that's got some junk. Okay. Right. It could be divorce. It could be whatever. Yes. Right. There's junk. And instead of coming alongside that person to help them with the junk, right? Let's get yep. your yard cleaned up. Let me help Instead, you with that. Instead, it feels to some people like there's people pointing at them saying from across the street right. saying, look at that yard. What a trashy yard. Right. And so we really mm. have to stop and remember these are human beings mm. at the end of the yes. day. Every human is they're created in God's image, in my opinion. <laughs> I love that analogy. I really do of like the homeowner looking across the street and making sure to point out all the perceived flaws or things that are wrong or sure. aren't correct, but it never dawns on them to walk across the street and help or to be part of, to befriend how about just befriending maybe we don't have to lead with telling people yeah they're I, so wrong i, I don't love know. that he said here you know without criticizing or giving condescending instruction yes he takes off his coat rolls up his sleeves and goes to work beside me sharing his skill and energy with me that is beautiful it is beautiful. The, the picture that it brings to mind is right absolutely beautiful because it's not the norm in our society anymore. So think about that today when there's that difficult person, you know, when there's that person maybe that you've kind of looked sideways at. (laughs) I've done it too. I'm not saying like I'm, you see them coming and you're like, I have done it a million times. I know. And I have been mm. convicted more times than not. Right. That that is not the way. That's just not the way. I agree. I've I would have missed out on some really good moments. We've had some beautiful moments. Yeah. Um, so, yes. So the, I'm just gonna just mm-hmm. challenge you again. Just listen to those words one last time, and then we're gonna move on to Psalm. So, are you yes. ready? I am so okay, ready. You get ready. I'm gonna read this one more time. Okay. Without criticizing or giving condescending instruction, he takes off his coat, rolls up his sleeves, and goes to work beside me sharing his skill and energy with me. In short order, the building begins to improve, and I feel as if I'm doing something again. Because for so many people, friends, that can be part of the stuck. You feel like you're not doing anything. You feel like, what what have I put into society today? What Am I just taking, taking, taking? Because, mm-hmm. you know, it feels good to put in. It feels oh, good to contribute. It does. There truly is nothing like it. And it's not in a sense that makes you feel your ego doesn't expand. It's not a self thing. No. And it's more how, I guess I would describe it like this. It's something where you leave those moments saying, I can't imagine being more blessed than I was. Yeah. And what a privilege that I got to do that. 
And that's the feeling you get. And you're like, I get to experience that. And it mm-hmm. comes in the form of giving when you take self out of it. Even if it's something that scares you a little bit or you're not real comfortable around, I double dog dare you to jump in the deep end mm-hmm. and just do it. Just mm-hmm. just do it. And the return, you're going to be left wanting to do more and more and more and more. Yeah. Not because you are so amazing, but because God will be present in you. He will fill you in a way. I promise you, you're not prepared mm. for it's, ah, I get excited <laughs> and then I don't want to stop talking about it. So. All right. We are going to jump in the way back machine, starting this thing up here. That's right. <laughs> the jalopy. That's right. The jalopy has <laughs> started and we are going to rewind back to Psalm and you are reading out of Psalm 59. 59 it is. All right. My God, rescue me from my enemies. Defend me from these mutineers. Rescue me from their dirty tricks. Save me from their hitmen. Desperados have ganged up on me. They're hiding in ambush for me. I did nothing to deserve this, God. Crossed no one, wronged no one. All the same, they're after me and determined to get me. Wake up and see for yourself. You're God. God of angel armies, Israel's God, get on the job and take care of these pagans. Don't be soft on these hard cases. They return when the sun goes down. They howl like coyotes ringing the city. Then suddenly, they're all at the gate, snarling invective, drawn daggers in their teeth. They think they'll never get caught. But you, God, break out laughing. You treat the godless nation like jokes. Strong God, I'm watching you do it. I can always count on you. God in dependable love shows up on time, shows me my enemies in ruin. Don't make quick work of them, God, lest my people forget. Bring them down in slow motion. Take them apart piece by piece. Let all their mean-mouthed arrogance catch up with them. Catch them out and bring them down. Every muttered curse, every barefaced lie, finish them off in fine style. Finish them off for good. Then all the world will see that God rules well in Jacob, everywhere that God's in charge. They return when the sun goes down. They howl like coyotes ringing the city. They scavenge for bones, and they bite the hands that feed them. And me? I'm singing your prowess, shouting at dawn your largesse, for you've been a safe place for me, a good place to hide. Strong God, I'm watching you do it. I can always count on you. God, my dependable love can't wait to ask David how he always knew what to write to me. <laughs> I always wish that I could somehow convey as we read how badly I wish that everybody could experience what it's like to read the Bible like this. It's just incredible how a book can move you to tears. This God, my dependable love. What a beautiful psalm. <laughs> Beautiful song. Now that I'm just a drippy, soggy mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, that's what we do sometimes here, so. And it's just joy. Yeah. It's like, you know, I've heard so often tears of joy, and it's what it feels like. Like, this is mine. Yeah. This could, this is me talking to God. Me and you and everybody that knows him. And I love the part where it says God just laughed at them. Like, oh, they think they can do that? What I liked about how that psalm and some of his other psalms I've noticed are written is it's like he's telling God, I know you're capable of this, so I'm telling you to just go ahead and do that. Like, I know. He I'm is not, so I'm not asking you bold. like, oh, would you please... I'm saying, I know you can do this, and I'm I'm telling you, please go out in front of me and take care yes, of this. Yes, go now and go do now this. And do this. Yes, it's not. And a just say, I'm watching very this happen. Bold prayers. 
we've gotten too far away from that. We should be able to approach God boldly because he's one. Why are we not praying boldly? All right, so now we're going to be ending the day and going back to numbers. So I'm going to be reading 28, 29, and 30. How was your numbers experience last week, Heidi? Who to thunk? I really, really have been enjoying numbers. And one of my most favorite chapters in all the Bible is chapter 27. Oh. The daughter's. Sure. Of Zelophehad. Yeah. What a beautiful God we had who yes. set women up and displayed how much he loved and thought of them. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, that was beautiful. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to be starting out in chapter 28 here in Numbers, and this one is titled Offerings. God spoke to Moses. Command the people of Israel, tell them. You're in charge of presenting my food, my fire gifts of pleasing fragrance at the set times. Tell them, this is the fire gift that you are to present to God, two healthy yearling lambs, each day as a regular whole burnt offering. Sacrifice one lamb in the morning, the other one in the evening, together with two quarts of fine flour mixed with a quart of olive oil for a grain offering. This is the standard whole burnt offering instituted at Mount Sinai as a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. The drink offering that goes with it is a quart of strong beer with each lamb. Pour out the drink offering before God in the sanctuary. Sacrifice the second lamb in the evening with the grain offering and drink offering the same as in the morning, a fire gift of pleasing fragrance for God. On the Sabbath, Sacrifice two healthy yearling lambs, together with the drink offering and the grain offering of four quarts of fine flour mixed with oil. This is the regular Sabbath whole burnt offering, in addition to the regular whole burnt offering and its drink offering. On the first of the month, offer a whole burnt offering to God, two young bulls, one ram, and seven yearling lambs, all healthy. A grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil goes with each bowl. Four quarts of fine flour mixed with oil with the ram and two quarts of fine flour mixed with oil with each lamb. This is for a whole burnt offering, a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. Also drink offerings of two quarts of wine for each bowl, one and a quarter quarts of wine for each ram and a quarter of wine for each lamb are to be poured out. This is the first of the month whole burnt offering to be made throughout the year. In addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its accompanying drink offering, a he goat is to be offered to God as an absolution offering. God's Passover is to be held on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of the month, hold a festival. For seven days, eat only unraised bread. Begin the first day in holy worship. Don't do any regular work that day. Bring a fire gift to God, a whole burnt offering, two young bulls, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. Sacrifice these in addition to the regular morning whole burnt offerings. Prepare the food this way for the fire gift, a pleasing fragrance to God, every day for seven days. Prepare it in addition to the regular whole burnt offering and drink offering. Conclude the seventh day in holy worship. Don't do any regular work on that day. On the day of first fruits, when you bring an offering of new grain to your God on the Feast of Weeks, gather in holy worship and don't do any regular work. Bring a whole burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs as a pleasing fragrance to God. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a he-goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. 
These are all over and above the daily whole burnt offering and its grain offering and the drink offering. Remember, the animals must be healthy. That's a lot of rules and regulations. It's astounding to me how much there was to keep track of. Absolutely. And I mean, and this had to be passed down from person to person, family Mm -hmm. to, I mean... Yes, it's a lot. <laughs> oh. It's a commitment, but it was also, I'm sure, what an immense honor mm-hmm. to be a Levite. Oh, yes. Set to apart. Be, yeah, you are set apart for God. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I mean, wow, though, the responsibility, I'm sure. This was, was hard work. Yeah. This was hard work. And it's not yeah, this work wasn't, that, uh, I mean, it's bloody. Oh, we're it's, doing sermons on the. On the uh, hard work. Yeah. Right. They didn't get the cushy jobs. Yeah. And these guys weren't doing wow. like sermons out in the, I was trying to think of what's the outdoor, like a amphitheater. Amphitheater. Yes. There we go. There's yeah, the No, word. no. <laughs> As, yeah. It was truly a lifelong yeah. obligation and dedication. All right, friends, here we go. Chapter 29. On the first day of the seventh month, gather in holy worship and do no regular work. This is your day of trumpet blasts. Sacrifice a whole burnt offering, one young bull, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy, as a pleasing fragrance to God. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for the bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each lamb, plus a he goat as an absolution offering to atone for you. These are all over and above the monthly and daily whole burnt offerings with their grain offerings and drink offerings as prescribed, a pleasing fragrance, a fire gift to God. On the tenth day of this seventh month, gather in holy worship, humble yourselves, and do no work. Bring a whole burnt offering to God as a pleasing fragrance, one young bull, one ram, and seven yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for the bull, four quarts for the ram, and two quarts for each of the seven lambs. Also bring a he goat as an absolution offering to attain for you in addition to the whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. Gather in holy worship on the 15th day of the seventh month. Do no work. Celebrate a festival to God for seven days. Bring a whole burnt offering, a fire gift of pleasing fragrance to God. Thirteen young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare a grain offering of six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for each of the bulls, four quarts for each ram, and two quarts for each of the fourteen lambs. Also bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering, with its grain offering and drink offering. On the second day, twelve young bulls, two rams, and fourteen yearling male lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and the lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the third day, eleven bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs, following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the fourth day, ten bulls, two rams, and fourteen male yearling lambs all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and lambs following the prescribed recipes, and bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the fifth day, nine bulls. I'm I'm sensing a trend here. I'm thinking I've heard (laughs) the the menu seems similar. The menu seems similar. Here we go. On the fifth day, 
on the fifth day. We, now we did that before. <laughs> we have done yeah. that before. <laughs> Nine bulls, two rams, and 14 male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and the lambs, following the prescribed recipes, and bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and, drumroll, drink offering. On the sixth day, eight bulls, two rams, and 14 male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and you guessed it, the lambs too, following the prescribed recipes, and bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular, yep, fill in the blank, whole burnt offering, that's it, with its grain offering and drink offering. On the seventh day, guess what? We're down to seven bulls. That's right. Two rams, 14 male yearling lambs. I'm thinking this is a lot of male yearling lambs. I mean, hokey wow. So these weren't, it wasn't. And these are healthy ones. I'm looking at this and I'm like, so God said to go tell the people that they have to, meaning Sure. All together, they brought this as a group, or did everybody have to bring this many? This is a lot. No, I think this is what the um, the Levites are doing. So here we go. We are on the seventh day. Guess what? We got seven bulls, two rams, and 14 male yearling lambs, all healthy. That's a lot of, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. I almost said out on a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on a lamb here and say, say that's a lot of lambs. This is a lot of healthy yearling lambs. I'm just going to say that. So here we go back into it. All healthy, prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and the lambs following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. On the eighth day, gather in holy worship, do no regular work. Bring a fire gift of pleasing fragrance to God, a whole burnt offering, one bull, one ram, and seven male yearling lambs, all healthy. Prepare grain offerings and drink offerings to go with the bulls, rams, and the lambs, following the prescribed recipes. And bring a he goat as an absolution offering in addition to the regular whole burnt offering with its grain offering and drink offering. Sacrifice these to God as sacrifice these to God as a congregation at your set feasts, your whole burnt offerings, your grain offerings, your drink offerings, and peace offerings. These are all over and above your personal vow offerings and free will offerings. Moses instructed the people of Israel to do all that God had commanded him. That's the end of chapter 29. This is a lot of, that's a lot of animals. You know how much I love animals. <laughs> I know. Like this would have been hard for you back in. <laughs> I can't like it would be so hard. I can for hear Heidi them. To go. I know. I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I imagine oh. that church oh. was a little loud back then. Mm. I know goats and young cows. Oh, so and rams are cool. But that's uh, the pr that's the cost of sin. It is. It's the cost it of is. sin, and I should be repulsed at the bloodshed. It was never meant to be that way. Blood was never meant to be shed. Mm. And look at us as humans. Something else had to die for us. We should feel not good about it. We should be impacted at the thought of all this loss of life. Just trying to atone for what we do. Ugh. I do have a quick pause from Eugene Peterson before I mm. end here for, yes, uh, on please. chapter 30. Uh, the pause, though, is from chapters 28 and 29 that we just read. So, Good. Even in the austere environment of the wilderness, where much work was required to maintain the community, the Israelites were commanded to keep the Sabbath. When we re-enter the sequence of days in which God spoke energy and matter into existence, we repeatedly come across the refrain, it was evening, it was morning. 
Genesis chapter 1. This is the Hebrew way of understanding day. It isn't ours. Most of our days begin with an alarm clock ripping through the pre-dawn darkness, and they end when we turn off the electric lights, because our definition of day is so different from the Hebrew concept. We have to make an imaginative effort to understand what the Hebrews meant by the phrase evening and morning, one day. More than idiomatic speech is involved here, there is a sense of rhythm. The day is the basic unit of God's creative work. Evening is the beginning of that day. The Hebrew evening-morning sequence conditions us to the rhythms of grace. We go to sleep, and God begins His work. As we sleep, He develops His covenant. When we awake, He calls us out to participate in his creative action. We respond in faith, in work. But always, grace is previous. And always, grace is primary. We awake into a world that we didn't make, into a salvation that we didn't earn. Creation and covenant are sheer grace and are there to greet us every morning. While we sleep, Great and marvelous things far beyond our capacities to invent or engineer are in process. From the moon marking the seasons to the earthworm aerating the soil to proteins repairing our muscles. Our work settles into the context of God's work. Human effort is honored, but it's never taken out of context and exalted. It's respected, not as a thing in itself, but by its integration into the rhythms of grace. Another really good insight from Eugene Peterson. He is so, so good at writing. What a gift. Yeah. What a gift. Yes. I think I'm going to find him when I get up there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, friends, thanks for buckling in and really powering through Mm -hmm. numbers with us today. We've got one chapter left. It's chapter 30. Hang in there. Hang in there. It's a quick one but meaningful, I'm sure, because it's all about vows. Mm. I mean, how many of you out there have taken a vow at one point? Right. So here we are. We're going to talk about vows in numbers. So Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel. This is what God commands. When a man makes a vow to God or binds himself by an oath to do something, he must not break his word. He must do exactly what he has said. When a woman makes a vow to God and binds herself by a pledge as a young girl still living in her father's house, and her father hears of her vow or pledge but says nothing to her, then she has to make good on all her vows and pledges. But if her father holds her back when he hears of what she has done, none of her vows and pledges are valid. God will release her since her father held her back. If she marries after she makes a vow or has made some rash promise or pledge and her husband hears of it but says nothing to her, then she has to make good on whatever she vowed or pledged. But if her husband intervenes when he hears of it, he cancels the vow or rash promise that binds her and God will release her. Any vow or pledge taken by a widow or divorced woman is binding on her. When a woman who is living with her husband makes a vow or takes a pledge under oath, and her husband hears about it but says nothing and doesn't say she can't do it, then all her vows and pledges are valid. But if her husband cancels them out when he hears about them, then none of the vows and pledges that she made are binding Her husband has canceled them, and God will release her. Any vow and pledge that she makes that may be to her detriment can be either affirmed or annulled by her husband. But if her husband is silent and doesn't speak up day after day, he confirms her vows and pledges. She has to make good on them. By saying nothing to her when he hears of them, he binds her to them. If, however, he cancels them sometime after he hears of them, He takes her guilt on himself. These are the rules that God gave Moses regarding conduct between a man and his wife and between a father and his young daughter who is still living at home. 
And that, friends, mm. is the end of that, numbers today. That was a nice way to end the numbers reading today. That was a nice way to end the numbers reading. Yeah, it was set up to be an example of God, the bridegroom, in his relationship with his church, the bride, mm. which is why it is a husband and wife or a father and a young daughter living at home. It's simply a representation. At least that is how I read it and interpret it. And I absolutely love it because it all comes down to this. God loves us so much that he will save us from bad choices or bad decisions or promises we never should have made. Mm. And it's beautiful how God set that up to be a picture of what he does for us. So I don't take this as any lesson or somebody mm. speaking for me as a woman or anything like that. I'm like, look at it as God's incredible grace to you. Because mm. we can be impulsive. We can say all kinds of things. We can this, we can that. But somebody can intervene on our behalf. Mm. Guess what? The men don't have that same option. Human men did, yeah. don't have that. Yeah. Your calling is far more difficult a position than it is for a woman. And I will say that out loud. I used to feel that it was much more difficult to be a female, you know, in the Old Testament or sure. this and that. But the way God sets it up, what he demands of men as husbands and fathers is exceptionally difficult. It's a lofty thing to mm. strive for. And, um, I'm really glad that I'm starting to read the Bible properly with yeah. eyes that see God's love and care through it. I appreciate you unpacking that because like, yeah. I really read it and didn't come away with that from mm. it. So I appreciate you unpacking that. Right. And I just let it kind of roll over me. Just I was taking it in because I initially I'm like, I'm not quite putting the pieces together until I suddenly remembered it's always been a picture of Christ in his church, you know, God, mm, the bridegroom. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, you can make vows, you can make promises, you can make pledges, you can really choose poorly. And what grace to know that our God is saying, hey, as your father, yeah. as your bridegroom, I'm going to step in here and I'm going to make sure that you're not held to having to fulfill that. Yeah. And I came away from that just really loving it and seeing an outpouring of God's love. And in yeah. that culture, I believe they would have seen that. So thank I'm, you. I'm hoping I study and find out I'm correct, but <laughs> uh, I think I'm pretty close. You haven't been arrested yet by the Bible police. The Bible police haven't. Yeah. Hmm, maybe they can't find me out here. Maybe so they can't. Yeah, that's right. Uh, We're completely under. I got my tinfoil hat. My windows are blacked out. Amen will that, to that. Will that help? So? Ooh, yes, it absolutely does help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, friends. Thank you so much for choosing to spend just a little bit of time with us today as we went through this journey through the message. I mean, this has been a good reading again today. It's been wonderful. It was, it felt a little bit, uh, maybe repetitive in part of numbers there, but when you look at, yes, the enormity of sin, right? Like, is, yes. is that me saying like, like, do I have to do all that for my sin? Is it yeah. really that big of a yeah, deal? You do. Mm -hmm. It keeps it in front of you all the time. Yeah. yeah. That's what it was about. Yeah. So friends, we're going to put the link for the Crossroads Run photos. Oh, check we'll them out. We'll even do uh, the Beautiful. link for that book that I made that has the excerpts from the students. Check it out. It really is beautiful. Share it with somebody that mm -hmm. just wants to be encouraged today because there Please. was some really beautiful messages in there. So. You don't have to be a runner to really appreciate the beauty in these photographs the course yeah. is just visually stunning yep stunning absolutely so friends thanks so much it's been great have a great day a great week and we look forward to seeing you next time on this journey through the message see you later